Welcome to Janet's Planet, where we are traveling at the speed of flight today. History is about to repeat itself. Over the past seven decades, the nation's best minds in aviation have designed, built, and flown a series of experimental airplanes to test the latest, most imaginative, and cutting-edge ideas related to flight. Short wings, long wings, delta-shaped wings, forward-swept wings, scissor wings, big tails, no tails, high speed, and low speed. Individually, each of these pioneering aircraft has its own story of triumph and setback. Together, they are known as X-Planes. Each of those X-Planes has an interesting story all its own. They've all made an incredible contribution to our understanding of flight, and X-Planes are really cool. On October 14, 1947, Air Force Captain Chuck Yeager climbed into the bright, orange, glamorous Glennis and flew the X-1 into the pages of history. The Bell X-1 was the first plane to fly faster than the speed of sound, thus breaking the sound barrier. Perhaps of all the X-planes NASA has been associated with, none was more cutting edge and became more famous than the X-15 rocket plane. The X-1 is the most famous because it was the first to go supersonic, but the X-15 was the most productive of our X-plane programs. Flown between 1959 and 1968, the winged X-15 reached beyond the edge of space at hypersonic speeds, trailblazing design concepts that contributed to the development of the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo piloted spaceflight programs. History is going to repeat itself yet again. Humans will take another giant leap. NASA is building a new generation of X-planes, the first all electric aircraft, the X-57 will increase fuel efficiency, significantly reduce carbon emissions and reduce unwanted noises. And the newest X-plane, the X-59, will be an aircraft that flies at supersonic speed, but instead of creating the annoying sonic boom, creates just a quiet sonic thump. The X-59 aircraft is an exciting addition to a long history of X-planes, including the X-1 and the X-15. NASA is working with Lockheed Martin to design, build, and flight test the X-59 aircraft. It's going to be about 97 feet long, fly at a Mach number of about 1.42, you know, which is roughly around, I don't know, 900 miles an hour. It's got a long nose, engine on top, highly swept wings, and a very carefully shaped fuselage to enable that low boom flight that we require for an airplane. The success of the X-59 could be the next giant leap for humankind here on Earth. This means one day in the not too distant future, you may be flying on a supersonic commercial flight over land, getting where you need to go in half the time. <laughs> How cool is that? Remember this, NASA is with you when you fly. Hello everyone, I'm Lori Bradner, your host with the Florida Aviation Network. Florida Aviation Network, we welcome you to our special broadcast in association with Janet's Planet. They are, we are broadcasting Janet's Planet live and in the clear from our studio right here in Orlando, Florida. This program is being sponsored by a NASA Next STEM Next Gen STEM grant. And we are going to be celebrating all things aerospace and aviation. We are so thrilled today to have my friend and co-conspirator, the CEO and founder of Janet's Planet, Janet Ivy. I can tell you, 
I have never met a more influential or inspirational STEM educator than my dear friend, Janet. We are so thrilled to have her here. Her mission is to inspire the next generation of aerospace experts and space explorers. Janet, are you there? We are, we are so, so excited, excited to, have to have you here. Welcome, welcome to our show. Thank you so much, my dear friend, Dr. Lori Bradner. We have traveled the country and halfway around the world teaching together and always my privilege. Thank you to the Florida Aviation Network. It is a thrill to be here to talk about the future of aviation. I want to pr promote NASA Next Gen STEM. There is some fantastic curriculum. And most people don't know this, Dr. Lori, is that the second word in the NASA acronym is aeronautics. Why? Why aeronautics before space? Well, you got to fly before you enter and go supersonic and get to the moon and Mars. And so just like the Wright brothers uh, started off things and we're pioneers in that, I want to remind everybody that NASA is with you when you fly. There is a piece of NASA engineering in literally every aircraft and spacecraft, and it's pretty exciting. We want to talk to some great experts today about how whomever you are, wherever you are, and you want to be part of aviation, aerospace, and NASA, and the next adventure in space, uh, space is open indeed for you, and we want to make sure that you know all about every possibility that is out there in your future. So I'm delighted to be here. We've got a great lineup of experts. And so, yeah, uh, yeah it's going to be a We are just day. so excited. And thank you for allowing Florida Aviation Network to be a part of your this broadcast and a part of Janet's Planet and all you do with the JP Astronaut Academy that's <laughs> broadcast live every day. And I know that we've got viewers and listeners from kindergarten to age 93, we've got students and teachers and pilots and people from the FAA that are watching. And we just want to welcome you. And we're so, so glad that you're with us. And I want to make sure, and we also have people that are listening online. And Janet, we've got quite the lineup today. You have lined up some very, very, very special guests for us. And do you know what? I don't think we should wait. I don't think we should keep them waiting any longer because our next guest is one of my favorite of all time. He is a hero when it comes to aviation as well as space exploration. So Janet, I'm going to hand it over to you to introduce our very first guest to kick off the show. And so Janet, back to you. All right, it is my great pleasure to welcome welcome Captain Hoot Gibson, five-time space shuttle astronaut. He was the chief astronaut for NASA. He had a wonderful career as a pilot for Southwest Airlines after his career at NASA. I read many an article on my dear friend, and apparently there's hardly a plane you haven't flown, right, Hoot? Well, I, I have flown quite a few airplanes. The, uh, the number is over 160 different airplanes, but uh, <laughs> gee, Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine put me on the cover of their magazine a couple of years back and they titled it, The Man Who Has Flown Everything. And I'm going, oh no, come on, I haven't flown everything. I've flown a lot of things, but not everything. <laughs> Well, you know, when we think about uh, the passing of Chuck Yeager, he was 24 when he went supersonic. Uh, now, I know you went supersonic in the space shuttle. Uh, how many other times or what was the favorite aircraft that you may have gone supersonic on? Oh, gee, I've been going supersonic ever since I was 24 years old as well. And uh, my first time was just riding in the backseat of an F-4 Phantom that was being flown by the first commanding officer of a Tomcat squadron, Sam Leet. But it's interesting, um, I, I've been going supersonic since I was 24 years old. And in fact, my, uh, my FAM-2, my second flight as a pilot in the F-4 Phantom was five days after I turned 25 years old. And that was the Mach 2 run. You would take it out to Mach 2. And in the Navy F-4 Phantoms, only the front seat had flight control. So I was totally in control of the thing going Mach 2 uh, when I was 
25 and 25 years and five days old. Now, it's like for everybody out there, we know supersonic is, you know, going faster than the speed of sound. I know that around Mach 1.4, I mean, is what, 900 miles per hour? What's Mach 2? How many miles per hour are you going at that point? Oh, golly. Mach 2 is going to be about 1,500 miles an hour. Yeah, uh, just a, is, just is a day be. in a race car, right? I mean, what does yes. that feel like? Well, it doesn't feel like anything. It's surprising. <laughs> uh, in, a, in a properly designed airplane, the only way you know that you're supersonic is the Mach meter indicates greater than 1.0. It indicates greater than Mach 1. Now, you do see a little bit of turbulence, and there's a little bit of a center of, uh, center of pressure shift right as you're going through Mach 1. So you can kind of feel that. But once you are through the, quote, sound barrier, which really isn't a barrier at all, but once you are through Mach 1, Everything smooths out, and it just feels like you're subsonic when you're actually going supersonic in a well-designed airplane. Well, NASA is working on their X-59, and they're trying to lower the boom of the supersonic flight. But when they are successful, we will be able to fly halfway around the world. And it's just like we're talking commercial supersonic flight. Uh, we'll be able to board a plane and get to wherever we want to go in about half the time. So I... I can't wait to uh, to fly in that one day, but I want you to tell everybody about sort of your initial um, inspiration or your initial introduction to flight. Who were your greatest, uh, I guess, greatest influencers? Great question, Janet, and um, my mom and dad. My mom and dad. I was so very fortunate to grow up in a flying family. Mom and dad were both pilots. So I literally have been flying with my parents since I was an infant. And my dad was the flight instructor who taught me how to fly. Mm -hmm. And I am so fond of saying that if I have done well as an aviator, it's because my dad taught me not just how to fly, but the whys behind it, mm -hmm. the reasons that airplanes behave the way they do. He was an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot. And he met my mother because my mother and two of her girlfriends from college decided they were gonna learn how to fly. And if you're gonna learn how to fly, you've gotta have an airplane. So the three of them went out and bought a J2 Taylor Cub. This would have been in about 1943. I think my mom told me they paid $900 for it. And they none of them knew how to fly yet, but they owned this airplane and that's how she met my dad. And so, as I say, I was fortunate to get to grow up in a flying family. My dad was my big inspiration. And I knew from the time I was about 10 years old, I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot just like my dad. Well, you have made him proud. I'm I'm sure a many, many, many times over. So again, you go from, I, I think I even have heard you tell a story where you were just a baby and your mom and dad were like, all right, we'll put baby hoot back there in the back of the plane and let's go fly somewhere. But you've been flying since you were an infant. Talk about becoming an astronaut in 1978 and then commanding the space shuttle. Well, I knew, Janet, that I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot. And I, I still remember the day I was looking through an aviation magazine and all of a sudden here was an artist's conception of a space shuttle flying a reentry. And I remember looking at that picture and saying, oh my goodness, this is an airplane that's gonna fly in space and then it's gonna glide back to earth and land on a runway. It's gonna be the world's highest flying and fastest flying airplane. I have got to get me one of those. <laughs> and from that moment on, I wanted to be an astronaut. Now, prior to that, I'd wanted to be a test pilot and an aeronautical engineer. And that wasn't really a big change. I was flying F-14 Tomcats at the time in the Navy's first operational squadron. And we were preparing uh, to deploy uh, for the very first time with the, uh, with the Tomcats. And it wasn't a big change of direction for me. I already knew I wanted to go to test pilot school. And I knew that if I wanted to be a space shuttle pilot, I would have to be a graduate of test pilot school. So it really wasn't a real big change of direction. 
but it wound up being a monumental change of direction for me. Unbelievable. Now, again, talk to everybody, you and Charlie Bolden, uh, I think maybe this was this your second space shuttle mission. You kind of have the distinction of doing something that was unplanned. Yes, we did. Um, I had the pleasure of flying with uh, Major General Charlie Bolden. Uh, back then, he was just a lieutenant colonel, but he and I flew the 24th flight of the space shuttle in January of 1986. And we came back at the end of six days. We were supposed to land at Cape Canaveral right at first light. And for three days in a row, the weather refused to cooperate with us. So we got waved off three times. And finally, mission control said, guys, we give up. The weather's no good in Florida. Go one more orbit around the earth and land in California at Edwards Air Force Base. So Charlie and I made the first unplanned night landing of a space shuttle. Now, I could see this eventuality coming about because if we didn't land at Florida, every other landing that we had anywhere else was going to be a night landing. Mm -hmm. So I had structured our training, our landing training, so that it was predominantly night training. Because if you can land it at night, you can certainly land it in the daytime. So although it was an unplanned night landing, and it was only the second time that a space shuttle had landed at night, uh, because we had, we had sent STS-8 up and with a planned night landing. We had not required a night landing ever since then. And then we were the 24th flight. So we were prepared for it. We were well-trained for it. And that's what I want everybody to hear. It was something unplanned, but your all of your flight training, all of your NASA training, you had contingencies and you were prepared. As, as we think about that great bit of wisdom, uh, and it can apply to anything, any field that we are in, what advice might you have for anyone out there, any age who might consider going, going to get a flight lesson or going into aviation and aerospace? Any last words or uh, advice you have for those people listening? Well, one of, you know, one of the things we always say is have yourself a backup plan. Make sure you have a backup plan. So in our case, we were supposed to make a daylight landing, and this was my first mission as commander. And we had a backup plan, and that was we've trained to make a night landing if we need to. But I could not advise more strongly to go into aviation, learn how to fly. It is just fascinating. The world really looks fascinating from, from up above in the air. It's a skill that you will enjoy your entire life just as I have, and it very frequently turns into a lifelong career. And so, okay. Maybe we start doing it because it's fun, but it winds up being a lifetime pastime and you will never look back and regret it, I promise you. Hoot, thank you so much. Always my dear friend, blue skies and tailwinds and tell Ray I said hello. I sure will. Thank you so much, Janet and Dr. Laurie. This has been a real pleasure for me. All right, thank you. Take care, my dear. Hoot, Captain Hoot Gibson, thank you. Janet, what an inspiration he is uh, to all of us. And I believe I want you to know just after listening to him, I want all of our listeners, those online and those that are tuning in to know you're never too old to learn how to fly. I'm a perfect example of that. But Janet, I want you to know launching, if I pick that term, launching off of Captain Hoot Gibson's talk with us, I now have a wonderful guest that's live in the studio here with me. I've got Cadet, uh, I've got Cadet Commander, believe it or not, Cadet Commander Olivia Jenkins with me. Olivia, thank you so much for joining us. Janet and I would like to welcome you. Welcome, Olivia. Awesome. Now, we just heard from Hoot Gibson, and he said that everyone should learn how to fly. And Olivia, tell us a little bit about yourself. And I noticed that you're in uniform and I believe it's a civil air patrol uniform. Would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. So I am 16 years old, um, which is pretty cool because I am in the process of learning how to fly right now. So one way that I'm doing that is through civil air patrol. 
Uh, Civil Life Patrol is a great program that I'm a part of and that anyone ages 12 to 21 and up can be a part of as well. So there are a few really cool aviation things that we offer. So first we have what are, what are called orientation flights. Okay. Those are free flight lessons that you can take through Civil Air Patrol. Awesome. We also have all kinds of scholarships and different academies that you can go to to learn how to fly. Excellent. Now, Olivia, we heard um, Hoot Gibson said that his inspiration to learn how to fly was his father. So I've got to ask you the very same question. What was your inspiration? Why do you fly? Who inspired you to fly, Olivia? Well, mine is actually the same. My dad inspired me to fly as well. He's a private pilot. He's been taking me up kind of on and off since I was a baby. So um, all throughout my childhood, I've always been in the air. And that really inspired me to want to learn how to fly myself. That is awesome. Well, Janet, we've got to make sure that we let Hoot know that Olivia's inspiration was also her father. Now, Olivia, I understand that you actually, you tell us a little bit about your flight training, what you've done and where you're at, because I believe that you actually, what you told me before we came on the air is that you actually flew a plane by yourself before you could drive a car by yourself. Is that true? Yes, that is true. So tell us that story. I'm so excited. So actually, that went back to my first real flight lesson. Um, I decided when I was 10 years old that I was going to fly a plane by myself before I could drive a car by myself. So on September 23rd of this year, I took my first solo flight. So, you know, took the plane by myself, no instructor or anything with me. Um, and I flew my first solo flight. And then about half weeks later, I got my driver's license and could drive a car by myself. So I didn't know how to fly before I could drive. Wow. Okay. You've got to tell our viewers and those that are listening, what, what was that experience like for you? The first time the instructor stepped out of that cockpit and that plane was all yours. What was it like? What were you feeling? Can you explain that to us? Yeah, of course. So um, there was actually a lot of preparation that went into that. Okay. I knew that the date was coming up for a long time before, about a okay. month before. Okay. Um, but I was really stressed out about it for like two weeks before. And then day of, we had gone in circles around the pattern. I knew exactly what I was doing. And as soon as my instructor got out, I was, I was so ready for it. I was just really excited at that point. All of the nerves faded away. That is awesome. And what are your future goals? And what, what are your future goals? And what would you say, Olivia, I'm going to end with the same question that Janet and Captain Gibson. What advice would you give to our listeners? So what is your future goal? And then what advice would you give? So my future goal is to go into the military, either the Air Force and fly airplanes, or I want to go into the Army to fly helicopters. Haven't really made the full decision yet. I'm um, kind of still looking at both. But I'd say my advice to anyone is to just make sure that you focus on school, but also don't lose, lose sight of your goals. So like set goals and make sure that you're sticking to them. But don't like lose anything along. Make sure that you're a well-rounded person and that you set those goals that you stick to them. That is awesome. And we need to give a shout out. Now, Olivia, I'm going to give a shout out to J.W. Mitchell High School where you're a student. So you can say hello to anyone out there that might be listening. And also to the North Tampa Lutz Cadet Squadron, where you are the commander. And one more time, can you talk about the two opportunities you mentioned young eagles flights and orientation flights is that where people that are interested in aviation can go to actually experience what it's like to be in the air yes those are two great resources so the young eagles flights are through eaa and then uh, civil air patrol has our um, orientation flights you can take 10 flights five of them are in a glide, and then five are in a powered aircraft those are completely free to cadets um, those are both really, really great reviews. Awesome. Well, Cadet Commander Jenkins, I want to tell you, it has been an absolute honor and a pleasure to have you here. On behalf of Janet and myself, we cannot thank you enough for being such an inspiration to all of those students in Janet's Planet Astronaut Academy. So thank you so much for being with us here at the Florida Aviation Network. We sure appreciate you. Thank you. Janet, I'm telling you, I could not be more inspired. And if I didn't know how to fly after talking to Olivia, 
I definitely would want to get into one of those flights and at least experience it for myself. Is she not amazing? Olivia, my sweet, uh, should I say, Commander Olivia, you are the future of aviation. This is why we all get excited. I want to say to all of the adults who might be listening, I know it sometimes that it's like, oh, what's the world coming to? This is what it's coming to, and the future is bright indeed. Uh, I have several kids that have are, have started taking their uh, flight lessons, and now I think even more will do so because of your great words this morning, Olivia. And speaking of great kids, we have a fantastic kiddo of mine. Uh, Christopher Lyons has been attending our Astronaut Academy since the spring. And not only does he love science and space, but he is also an actor. You will be able to see him next summer in an Amazon Prime show called Ultimate Invasion. It's a little bit Mork and Mindy meets Stranger Things. But uh, Explore Mars had a great campaign called Why I persevere. And so he tells us why he perseveres and dreams about space, as well as why space education is so very important. Let's watch Christopher now. Hi, my name is Christopher. I persevere because I know within that all challenges have solutions. The solution can be so significant that it can change the world and impact humanity in a positive way. A great leader by the name of Mr. Carl Anderson once said, we are either in the process of quitting or overcoming. So when I think about the word perseverance, I get excited about the idea of seeing what the outcome will be if I don't quit, if I do not give up. What would the outcome be if I persevere? As humans, we have to persevere in order to grow. You see, oftentimes when we least expect it, life presents us with a challenge to test our courage and resilience. When we push through these challenges, we find success. To persevere is to be human, and my generation will persevere when we return back to the surface of the moon, when we step foot on Mars, and as we explore beyond. Space education is important for several reasons. When we have the opportunity to study space, it not only helps us understand space, it also helps us understand our planet better. Also, we humans are naturally curious. So space education provides us with endless opportunities to explore limitless unknowns and to solve mysteries within our universe. I happen to think that learning about space is a lot of fun. When we strive to learn more about the space environment, we end up gaining a lot of knowledge that helps us understand our planet. We are able to develop amazing space technologies that benefit from space and life here on planet Earth. There is no doubt that Cadet Commander Olivia Jenkins and Christopher are most definitely NASA's next generation of STEM, not only explorers, but aerospace experts. It is such an honor and they are so inspirational to all of us and doesn't matter what your age is. Now, Janet, I believe, I bet Christopher, I have a hunch, I'm guessing that Olivia and Christopher know something of hmm, that game called Minecraft. <laughs> That's a very, very popular game. I know my children know it. And Janet, I'm going to hand it over because we have two very special guests with the coolest creation ever that even makes me want to play Minecraft. <laughs> and so, Janet, I'm going to hand it back over to you to introduce our next guest that you've lined up for us. This is such an amazing show. Janet, thank you. The Florida Aviation Network can't thank you enough. 
Well, I am delighted to introduce our next two guests. Blair Hess and Chuck Hack. Uh, Tackett are both with the Federal Aviation Administration. They are in executive operations. They are overseeing a lot of the advances in aviation. They're overseeing a lot of the things that are happening with the FAA and some of your STEM challenges. We'll get to the one that you recently did in Minecraft in just a moment. But I would love for you all to just share with everyone about what the FAA is doing in aviation presence presently and where you see aviation going in the future. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, um, it, there's a lot that's happening over the, over the next couple of decades. Um, Boeing just released a study that said that we're going to need over a million pilots and mechanics over the next 20 years. Wow. And so it's been exciting to listen to the uh, to Hoot talk and people talk about space. But you think about it, almost every person who flies in space started as some kind, something in aviation, either a pilot or just a general interest in aviation. So we at the FAA are trying to find ways to reach out to a wider audience. And so some of the ways we've done that is by creating the game that we created. Um, we know people are interested in drones, but people think of drones as small toys. Within the next couple of years, we're gonna be flying, people are gonna be flying inside drones, like you would a helicopter. Um, and again, we talked about with space, not just uh, you know, people, you know, being astronauts, but actually commercial people actually flying to space to do things. So the future is exciting. And so the FAA, we're just, we're just trying to reach out and, and, and get a broader audience and get a broader group of folks interested in aviation, because we're going to need those folks to help us move to the future. When you talk about yeah. needing one million people, my mind is kind of blown. You know what I mean? It's like, what? But that's a large, large number of aerospace folks that you that you need. Talk a little bit more. It's like when uh, we, we had you on the Academy earlier this year, and you guys said that some airports are already planning for flying cars, these flying drones you're talking about. Absolutely. There's a group called Joby Aviation. They just took over what uh, another group called the Uber. We're all familiar with Uber. Uber actually for a, a, a while was uh, researching uh, people-sized drones. They're, they're, they're basically just very large versions of the toys you play with at your house. Uh, Joby Aviation thinks the next year or two, possibly, it depends on FAA rules and regulations, getting everything approved, they actually may be able to start carrying passengers very, very soon. So that's, that's what we're talking about. And so, whereas you'd have a helicopter, which is extremely noisy, uh, it's expensive to use, uh, these new drones are supposed to be somewhere, I think, 70 to 80 percent quieter than a normal helicopter. Uh, and because of that, they're going to have a, a lot more opportunity to fly where other helicopters could not fly in the past. Sign me uh, up yeah. for my own flying drone. I'll just tell you that. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> now, Blair, do you want to add anything, uh, you know, along with what we're talking about here, just about where you see things going or any updates about challenges that the FAA has as far as STEM goes? You know, the exciting thing, Janet, is that we can see the future coming and it's coming fast. So we're trying to do everything we can to prepare that next generation. Uh, you know, young people like, like Cadet Commander Olivia there that have an interest already. And then those kids in the world that maybe don't know that they have an interest in aviation, we wanna be able to ignite that spark. We wanna be able to, to share with them opportunities that they don't know exist yet so that we can bring them on board in an exciting industry that's just growing by leaps and bounds. And one of the ways we're doing that is, is through STEM programs that we're introducing uh, right now on a large scale virtually. So we have a graphic we could pull up on the screen here that shows some of the examples Let's go to the next one and, and look at the airport design challenge piece. And so this is a program that Chuck and I were blessed to be able to put together earlier this year um, on the heels of needing to get involved in virtual teaching and, and outreach to kids. We thought we could leverage the, uh, the game Minecraft and put together an opportunity to teach young people all about how airports are developed, how they operate, and then how they're looking at growing. So we've seen kids get real creative and they've put together spaceports and they've put together, we had, we had a student in our recent run of this program who built an aircraft carrier complete with, with uh, fighters and helicopters and everything on the deck of the boat and just amazing things that we're seeing. 
In fact, if we have just a minute, we, we'd like to share a video that just shows some samples of the work that we're seeing from these, these young folks. Oh, please do. I, can, I love this so much. Fantastic. Isn't that exciting? I had to say, for as many a kids that I have that love Minecraft, I was so happy to push this out. I hope you guys had a ton of people participate. You know, we were we were blown away by the uh, the participation in this round of the game. We we had over almost thirteen hundred students in twenty two countries that enrolled oh, and stupendous. participated. And that we just closed last week our final entries, and they're in, they're under judging right now. But the samples we've seen have just been mind blowing. They've been so incredible. We uh, we we rank these airport creations based on their technical accuracy, their creativity, innovation that they can see for the future, and then they wrap everything up into a five minute tour of their airport, and we we rank them on their presentation ability as well. So they're using technology, they're gaining confidence, they're learning about airports, they're learning about aircraft. And we're looking forward to more challenges and exciting innovations in STEM where we can introduce young folks to different kinds of airframes, to rockets, to all sorts of things through similar software programs and opportunities that we can do right from the comfort of a desk, but reach the entire world. And it's just super exciting. Well, I'm telling you again, I just want to keep saying it. The best people that I work with are between K, uh, kindergarten and uh, 12th grade. There's some really amazing, great kids. And I think that as good adults uh, like yourselves, thank you for providing programming and challenges that just, again, we've got to keep their hands on it. We've got to keep their minds in it. We've got to provide them opportunities to have real world experience and contact with experts. And I think that's how we create this next generation of one million strong. You heard it here, everybody who's listening. Uh, if you've been going, hmm, I wonder what should I do with my life? The FAA sounds like it has plans. So uh, tell us a little bit more, Chuck, about some of the other opportunities at the FAA. So yeah, I, many people think about aviation. You think about pilots and so you think about, well, other than, other than that, what could I be? Well, maybe I could be an air traffic controller. Okay, well, how about a mechanic? Okay, well, okay, those are the, the, the probably the more popular ones we hear about. How about a lawyer? The FAA has all kinds of lawyers. How about uh, doctors? Uh, with the COVID, most recently, some of you may have actually read this in the news. Uh, we have aviation doctors who are trying to figure out, you know, can and we can now, can we use, uh, have pilots take the vaccine for COVID? And we even have to apply for this, don't we? Wade, do yes. you have that slide? Yeah, if you bring that up for us. But continue while he brings well, so, it so up. So anyway, you know, when, when the slide comes up, you'll see there's just a wide variety of jobs that you would not necessarily think about. Computer engineers, Economist, FA needs economists, not a whole bunch, but we need a couple. Um, so pretty much anything you can think of that you would want to do with your life, if you want to associate with aviation, it can be done, most likely. And again, I think those things are the 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 things we don't think about. You just listed some of those, but acquisitions, if you love numbers and financials, if you love building things and construction, uh, if you love the law, their legal ramifications. I'm sure there are going to be some legal things when we start having humans in drones, although I really want my George Jetson drone to fly about, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and again, if you think about just drones alone, people think of, again, drones as toys. Drones are really aircraft. They're called unmanned aeronautical air aircraft systems because they are UAS, they are aircraft. So they're gonna need the same kind of things, people to maintain them, people to fly them, uh, you know, people to invent new things to do with them. Uh, again, we could spend all day just talking about the drones, but again, that's what we're talking about. Is we, it's, there's a, so many non-traditional ways to look at an aviation career, and we encourage you guys to do that.
So as we have our last few moments with the both of you, maybe Blair, you go first and then Chuck, uh, if you'll wrap it up. What do you want the general public to know about the opportunities of the FAA and the future of aviation and what and where they might even come to find out more about what you do there? Thanks, Janet. I'd love to. So there's there's a ton of opportunities coming and there's there's an entire workforce within the FAA that's being stood up right now to focus on STEM and aviation space education efforts. Um, great people, a big team, and they're putting a lot of energy into creating programs that can innovate and, and just inspire the students of the world to be able to learn about our industry and to find the passion that falls into it. Chuck mentioned some of these careers. Did you know that you can drive a, a road grader and still impact aviation? Uh, you can build buildings and do electronics and climb into vaults and climb towers and do all sorts of great things and have an, a leading role in keeping the national airspace system safe. We want to help kids understand what those opportunities look like so that as they're finding education chances, they know where they want to go and they know where they want to work, whether that's with the FAA or with one of our stakeholders in the industry, we all play a big role in helping each other through it. Uh, and I also want to jump in real quick. It's never too late to jump in for a career in aviation. Some people, some of the people we've heard, you know, have had a lifelong love for aviation. A lot of folks may have never considered that as, until right now. It's never too late. It's, it's always, again, there's so many things you can do in aviation and related to the aviation world. Uh, give it a shot. You never know. Uh, uh, you love math. Okay, great. We need mathematicians. We need statisticians. Uh, whatever your interest is, think about also how that can relate to aviation, and you're, you're probably going to find out that it can. And tell us your website before we go. So everything is available at www.faa.gov, and from there, if you search for STEM or AVSED, A-V-S-E-D, uh, it'll pull up all the information. We've got a listserv, um, Gov delivery email address or email directory that you can subscribe to where you'll get announcements about upcoming programs and opportunities. And Janet, we'll shoot that over to you so that you can list it on the notes here and on your site. We'd love your, your help in getting the word out about that. Because as these new programs come online and we have things ready to go, we'll be really ready to have all of your emails there so we can get you the first, the first line up into it. Uh, I've got students that I'm sure that are waiting for it. So thank you, Chuck and Blair, so much. All right, Captain Lori, we have also some other places well, and people I just, to introduce. I wanted to say thank you to Blair and Chuck because we are in an unprecedented time of education, Janet. And I want to give them a shout out and to say thank you so much for their innovation and for helping teachers like myself engage students, and especially given that so much of what we do now and what we've done in education has gone online. And so we need people like Blair and Chuck who are thinking outside the box, not only to inspire and engage students, but to help teachers. And so I just wanna give a shout out to teachers to go to that www.f aa.gov and search STEM education. And so I want to say thank you to them. And Janet, this is a great segue because you really heard the need of not only the teachers, but the students and the homeschool parents when we were, obviously, we were hit with was something that none of us could have ever expected um, with this pandemic. And when everything went online and you heard the call and thanks to NASA, thanks to a grant, thanks to NASA's Next Gen STEM, you started JP Astronaut Academy. And I can't think of a better way to have you tell us a little bit about the Janet's Planet's Astronaut Academy because that's a great introduction for our next guest that I know you and I both absolutely adore and love dearly. So I'm going to hand it over to you to talk a little bit about the JP Astronaut Academy and introduce our very next guest that I promise our viewers and those online and those listening, you are not going to want to miss. And I don't know if you guys have that video standing by, but maybe we do just a little bit of that promo video and then I'll tell you more about it. Awesome. Do you have the right stuff? Then blast off. 
to Janet's Planet Virtual Astronaut Academy. Learn from real astronauts, real pilots, real space experts, and real engineers. Welcome to Janet's Planet, where we're traveling at the speed of thought. And basically, guys, I just, when I knew what was happening in March, uh, I saw, I thought, what am I going to do? I need to be with kids. And, you know, naively, I thought, I'll just go online. I'll offer some courses. Maybe they'll be interested. Maybe this is a help, you know, when this is over in a couple of weeks. Well, here we are nine months later. But I believe so intently that the next generation of aviators and space explorers are out there and all they need is just a spark and some hands-on and some introductions to uh, great experts. And our next guest is, I'm telling you, this man will answer my email near every time I like email, hey Don, uh, there's some kids who wanna talk to an astronaut. And he's like, sure, Janet. This is Dr. Don Thomas, four-time space shuttle astronaut, and again, my friend extraordinaire who always says yes when I elicit a call and say, I got a group of 10 kids in Montana, and he said, sure, sign me up. So Don, welcome this morning. Tell everybody a little bit, I think one of your best stories is how you became an astronaut, how you were so relentlessly committed to seeing that dream come true. Thanks, Janet. It's great to be with everybody here today. And as Janet mentioned, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut since I was six years old. And when I was six, NASA la launched the very first astronaut to space a long time ago, May 5th, 1961, almost 60 years ago from Cape Canaveral in Florida there. And I watched that launch at my elementary school in Cleveland, Ohio. I was just in kindergarten. And they had us all come to the gymnasium and I watched the launch on a small black and white TV. And as soon as Alan Shepard had made it to space, I remember sitting there saying to myself, I wanna do that. So ever since I was six, I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to ride a rocket. I wanted to experience zero gravity floating around in space. So I always knew what I wanted to do, but I wasn't sure, well, how do you become an astronaut? You know, we only had seven American astronauts at that time, and I didn't know any of them. But the one thing I recognized early on was it was going to be tough, very difficult. There's a lot of competition. Thousands of people apply to be astronauts, and then just a small handful are selected. So I knew as a young boy, my only you know, shot of ever making it to space would have to involve me working hard and doing my best in school every single day. And that's what I did in math and science, but reading, art, history, music, gym, whatever I worked on, I gave it my best effort. So I worked hard through school. After high school, I went on to college. I went to Case Western Reserve University. I got my bachelor's degree in physics, one of the sciences, and that's the minimum degree. You need to become an astronaut, a four-year college degree in math, science, engineering, or the medical field. But I knew the competition was gonna be tough, so I stayed in college and I got my PhD in engineering. So after nine and a half years of college, I finally got out and I started applying to NASA to become an astronaut. NASA selects new groups of astronauts every three or four or five years. They'll pick a small group of five or 10, 15, depending on their needs. And two years after I got out of college, NASA had the announcement they needed new astronauts. I was all excited. I wrote to them. I got the application form. I carefully filled it out. I mailed it in and NASA turned me down. I was surprised, but I said, well, I'm not going to give up. I'll try again. Two years later, another astronaut selection. Got another application, filled it out, sent it in. And that second time, they said no again. And at this point, I decided I need to do more to get noticed by NASA because I wasn't even getting close in the competition. And being an engineer, what I did is I studied the data. I carefully looked into the backgrounds of the people that were successful to see what do they have that I don't have? What am I missing here? And by studying that, I learned a few things. The first was most of the astronauts that they were selecting already had some flying experience. It wasn't a requirement, but it seemed to help. So I decided, well, I can do that. And I started taking flying lessons and I got my pilot's license and my instrument rating. And I was working on my glider rating at that time as well. I also noticed that most of the astronauts they were selecting had some parachuting 
or skydiving experience. Again, not a requirement, but something that seemed to help. So I learned to do that. I also taught a university course. That seemed to be experience NASA was looking up for. So I worked on these activities and three years later, another astronaut selection, I sent my application in. And this time I made you know, the group of 100 semi-finalists. So out of the thousands of people that apply, NASA will select just 100 individuals and they bring you to Houston. I spent a week there you know, with the uh, medical testing, very extensive medical testing. And then there was a one hour interview. And at the end of my week, I thought, boy, it couldn't have gone any better for me. I went back to my job. And then it was about two months later, I got a phone call from NASA and they said, no, thanks. We don't want you. And after being down, turned down three times, I decided, well, that's it. You know, clearly NASA doesn't want me. So I decided, you know, I'll go to bed, get a good night's sleep. And then in the morning, I'll put together a new plan for my career that does not involve being an astronaut. I went to bed that night. The next morning when I woke up, the very first thought that popped into my head was, I still want to be an astronaut. So I asked myself again, is there anything more I can do to improve my background? And I studied again who, who the astronauts were, what were their backgrounds. And I noticed that most of the civilian astronauts NASA was selecting, they were individuals already working at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. So I moved down to Houston. I got a job with NASA as an engineer on the space shuttle program, did that for three years. Then there was another astronaut selection. This is number four. I sent my application in. I got called up for the medical testing and the interviews, and that all went very well. And then about three months later, I got another phone call from NASA. And this time they said, Don, are you still interested in being an astronaut? Because we'd like to offer you the job. I said, yes, I hung up the phone. And then for the next 10 minutes, I was jumping up and down, yelling and screaming because I knew I made it into the program. So I was 35 years old when I got that call. I started a four-year training program for my first flight. So the first time I made it to space, I was 39 years old. And the number one lesson I've learned in my life is to never, never give up. You know, everybody out there today, we all have dreams for our future, big dreams and small dreams. Never give up on your dream. I almost gave up on mine, and had I given up on that, I wouldn't be with you here today. Don, I have heard you tell this story, I don't know how many times, and I could listen to it over and over again. It is such a great call to all of us that if there is something that burns deep inside of us that says, yes, this is what my heart, soul, and purpose wants, you know, where my passion is, this is where I want to go. Thank you so much for your story. Thank you so much that you didn't give up, that you are here to share your story with so many of my students whenever I call. I am ever, ever in your debt and oh so grateful. And there's our friend, Dr. Lori Bradner, who wants to say hi to you, Don. Yes, I did. Dr. Don, thank you so much. And I'm with Janet. Every time I hear that story, I'm going to apply again. That's it. Yeah. I'm going to be a grandma in space, but I'm going to apply again. <laughs> Girl, <you got it. laughs> I tell you what, I, we cannot, we are so honored to have you here joining us on the Florida Aviation Network and with Janet's Planet. And I, I just want you to know you are I'm telling you what, you're the bee's knees. You are one of my favorite people of all time. And Dr. Don, I want to grow up and be you. And thank <laughs> you. Thank you for all that you do to inspire my students and our students and the youth and NASA's next generation of STEM experts and space explorers. You know, I left NASA 13 years ago to join education because I want to see us get to Mars. I'm yes. too old to go to Mars. You know, I'm, I'm 65, and by the time we go to Mars in 10 or 20 years, I'm too old for that. So I want to help the next generation get there. And yes. that's what my mission is. And that's why I enjoy working with you, Lori, and, and you as well, Janet, with Janet's Planet. Uh, I love the mission of inspiring that next generation because it's all of you out there today listening and watching the program. You are the ones who will be helping us with these missions, you know, getting us, us ready to go to Mars. I'm too old for that. It's up to you guys. So again, work hard, do your best in school every single day. And the key, never, never give up on that dream that you have inside. Thank you so much, Dr. Don. I will see you very soon, I am sure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Janet, I'm telling you what, again, I, I could listen to him again and again. What, what a wonderful guest. And you know what? I think he said it best. 
we are we are on to Mars. We are moving to Mars, and more. We're hearing also about the Moon and the importance of the Apollo mission and going to the Moon. And Janet, I think you have a special video to show us. I do, especially with the recent uh, selection of the Artemis team, nine women, nine men, very diverse. It's like we've got geologists, we've got submarine experts, we've got test pilots, we've got doctors. So again, if you are sitting there going, you mean me? I'm the Artemis generation? Yes, because you're going to see, you're going to have your Apollo 11 moment that happened almost, uh, you know, 51 years ago. You're going to have the Artemis moment in 2024 when we see the first woman and the next man step on the moon. And we have a fantastic contest. NASA has partnered with Future Engineers, and they've got a NASA Moon Pod essay. You have until Thursday, so you got just a few more days before the deadline, but it's only a couple of hundred words. So watch this video and get inspired to write your way to the moon. Do you have the right stuff? Then blast off. Welcome to Janet's Planet, where we're traveling at the speed of thought. Imagine leading a one-week expedition on the moon and write an essay that tells NASA all about it. Houston, this is the commander of Moon Pod 1, initiating airlock procedure. It's time to explore. Entries are due by December 17th, 2020. Remember, you are the Artemis generation. NASA is taking remote learning to the moon. 2020 has been a year of working and living at a distance. Now consider what it might be like if you were living with a pod of astronauts 250,000 miles from Earth. Your challenge is to imagine leading a one-week expedition at the moon's south pole with the whole world cheering you on. Tell us about the types of skills, attributes, and or personality traits that you would want your moon pod crew to have and why. How many would be in your pod? And of course, you'll need high-tech gear and gadgets. In your essay, also describe one machine, robot, or technology that you would leave on the lunar surface to help future astronauts explore the moon. Now, your essays must meet these requirements. Grades K through four, you have up to 100 words for your essay. Grades five through eight, you have 200 words. Grades nine through 12, you have up to 300 words, but please do not put your name in the entry. For all entry requirements and judging criteria, please read the rules. Now, there is so much to research before writing your essay, so visit the Education Resources section on the futureengineers.org website to learn about the moon, NASA's Artemis program, and to brainstorm your expedition. Artemis is committed to landing the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024, and we're excited for you to join the adventure. Every student who submits an entry will receive a certificate from NASA and be invited to a special NASA virtual event with an astronaut. Selected semifinalists will be invited to represent their state or territory in a series of Artemis Explorer sessions with NASA experts. Nine finalists will travel with a grown up to NASA's Johnson Space Center next summer to learn about lunar exploration and the national winner in each grade division will win a family trip to see the first Artemis test launch to watch the most powerful rocket in the world launch from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. So let your mind revolve around this thought. Write your moon expedition story. And who knows, you just might end up living out your essay. And that's the view from Janet's Planet. Janet, I just want to say thank you to you because I know as an educator, uh, thank you for helping us to integrate writing and reading into our science, technology, and engineering and mathematics curriculums. This is so important. And this Artemis Moon Pod essay, I know that it's due on Thursday. So I'm going to encourage all of the teachers that are listening and all the students that are listening to join my students in the competition. Because after having you live in my classroom, which I want to make sure that teachers know that they can reach you on janetsplanet.com, that you will broadcast live into your into their classrooms, help us to break down the walls of our classrooms and bring all things space, all things aviation, all things inspirational and engaging 
right into our classes, whether they be online or in brick and mortar in person. But I just want to say thank you for inspiring my students. Oh, they were so fun. We talked a lot about the perseverance and the ingenuity uh, mission that uh, they'll, that will land on February 18th, 2021. But teachers, if you're going, uh, what can we do? What can we do? Email me, Janet at Janet'sPlanet.com. It's like if you let me know far enough in advance, we can even maybe ship you some supplies in case we do hands-on things. Recently, we were playing around with the uh, NASA has a sound activity. When we talk about going supersonic, we have to talk about how we lower that boom. We can't interfere with nature, animals, people, etc. And so we talked about how we amplify sound and we made just a very simple little amplification device, a couple solo cups and a paper towel roll and then we talked about like uh, what would dampen that sound and made chevrons out of foam and that sort of thing so if you hit me up in time I might be able to send you the resources that you need come and talk to you and uh, spend some time with your students it would be awesome. my pleasure Janet well we are so grateful uh, to you and for so thankful for all that you do for us thank you so much for that now our next guest Janet that you've lined up is actually we know him here at the Florida Aviation Network as the weather guy we have Mr. George Bartuska and he actually serves as a weather instructor for the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary as well as the Lakeland Civil Air Patrol so without further ado, and of course, we can't talk about aviation without talking about the weather, because it's always about, at Florida Aviation Network, it's always about safety first. So without further ado, it is truly my honor and pleasure, both on behalf of Janet and myself, to introduce our weather guy, Mr. George Martuska. Take it away, George. Thank you, Dr. Bradner. And as you said, we can't talk about aviation or aeronautics or space exploration without talking about the weather because the Earth has an atmosphere. But what is the weather? Well, a very simplified definition of the weather is the equalization that takes place between the sun heating up the air and the water on planet Earth and encountering different temperatures and the fact that the Earth is turning we think of it like a rotisserie, like a rotisserie chicken is turned and it gets heated at different times. Now, planet Earth is a very complicated planet in the solar system. If Earth was just a ball of water like this and it turned, it would, uh, the sun would heat it up near the equator and the air would rise and it would sink back to the poles and we would have nothing but two cells of weather going on on the planet Earth. But unfortunately, or reality is that the Earth is a very complicated structure. 70% of the Earth is covered with water, almost three quarters of it. The Pacific Ocean itself covers half of the globe. Well, that water, it turns out, is the dynamite of driving the weather. The combination wa of water and the energy from the sun are what really give us the weather that we talk about. Um, we have people watching us today from all over the world, all over the United States. There are different kinds of weather in the Midwest, out on the East Coast and on the West Coast. But in Florida, we're predominantly infected by the water that's around, directly around the outside of the peninsula. Florida is surrounded on three sides by water. And as a result, in the summer, it's almost like we live in a weather laboratory. We have thunderstorms every afternoon and the reason is the dynamite that's in this water that's in the water so i want to take you if you've never been to any of our florida beaches hopefully you've been to a beach somewhere i want to take you to a beach and the picture i have on the screen this is south daytona thank you south daytona beach where we can park on the beach and let's pretend that car on the left that dark colored car is our car. We get to the beach, we lock up the car, we go out and swim for a couple hours and we come back to the car and we open the door. And as we do, this bubble or what we call in meteorology, a partial of air comes out of the car and starts to rise. And as it rises, it expands. And as it expands, it cools. And if the air doesn't have that air bubble, that partial doesn't have much 
water vapor in it, it's going to go up to, say, around 5,000 feet. And at that point, it will have expanded and cooled to the temperature of the air surrounding it. And that'll be it. It'll just run out of steam and it'll, if anything, might start to settle back down. But now let's change the story. We came back to our car. We opened the doors. We're soaking wet and the air, the air is evaporating. So we're a little cool. We take the towels and we dry off. And now all that water that was on us from the ocean water is on our towels. And we see down the beach, there's a hot dog truck. So we decide to go down and get a hot dog and some drinks. And we take those towels all full of water and we throw them in the car. We lock the car up again and we go down the beach. And when we get down to the hot dog stand, we run into some friends. So we're there for maybe 45 minutes to an hour. During that time, the solar radiation inside the car, the whole system is acting like a greenhouse and it's heating those towels and the water that were in the towels. And that water is evaporating and becoming part of the air that's in the car. We call that the air becoming saturated. Now, this time when we come back to the car, say after an hour, and we open the door, there is another bubble of air, a partial of air. But this time the air is full of water vapor. It's saturated with water. This time when the air starts to rise, it cools and it expands. But when it gets up to around, we'll just say 5,000 feet at the condensation level, the air has cooled to the dew point and the water starts to condense out of that air. And when that happens, it gives off heat because it takes heat for that process to take place. And that makes it like a hot air balloon, more so like a hot air balloon. And it starts to rise because of convection. And the higher it goes, the cooler it gets, the more water is condensing. And it can get going 60 to 100 miles an hour. And that, go back to my slide, that is the process that's taking place to give us these thunderstorms. Now, once again, depending on where you live, anywhere there's a place where there's a boundary of water and, um, and earth, like we have here in Florida or anywhere on the coast or anywhere near a large lake, the water gets heated up. The water and the land are getting heated the same by the solar radiation, but the water heats up slowly, slower than the land because it has a higher heat capacity. And thus the land gets heated up and it re-radiates this heat and the air starts to rise and we get this current that we call a sea breeze. The unique thing is in Florida, I want to emphasize that picture on the bottom, if you could move me up a little bit. In, thank you. In Florida, we have a unique situation where we have this Gulf Coast side of Florida and we have the Atlantic side of Florida. We have two sea breezes being generated simultaneously and that creates a dual movement of air towards the center of the state. This is what happens during the summer. And if there were no other local weather systems happening or no other regional weather systems happening, we'd have thunderstorms line up right down the middle of the state every day in the summer. But it changes a little bit because we do have typically some kind of weather system or an influence of the jet stream. And thus the broadcast meteorologist on TV or the radio will say, well, we're going to start with thunderstorms on the East Coast uh, the, uh, this afternoon about four o'clock. They're going to be drifting over towards the West Coast and then they might come back to the East Coast. So that's the phenomena of weather here in Florida. And let me go to the next slide. So what we have generated are the are the elements we need to create a thunderstorm, what we call an air mass thunderstorm in the southeast, where we have an updraft created by that um, um, heating of the air and convection. And once the rain starts, once the condensation starts and the rain starts, the air is coming down and thus generates a downdraft or maybe even a microburst if it's intense enough. And from this, we have we learn that there are three stages of a thunderstorm. We have the cumulus stage, which is where we start the process. We enter into the mature stage of the thunderstorm, which is where we get the rain and the and the thunder and the lightning and the if we're going to be any tornadoes and hail. And then literally the storm rains itself out. And here in Florida, you can look up and literally see the storm disappear right in front of you if you watch it long enough. Now, Florida is a very unique place because after World War II, 
all the planes we lost during the war, we found out that a lot of them were lost due to weather. So we had a project called the Thunderstorm Project for a year here in Florida and then a year in Ohio at what became uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We flew uh, five aircraft into uh, thunderstorms at 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25,000 feet. These were all volunteers. We never fly normal planes into a thunderstorm, but these planes, they took all the ordnance, all the guns, all the bullets off them, and just put weather instrumentation on them. And from that came this understanding of the cumulus, of the mature stage, and of the dissipation stage. And it's mentioned in every book written on meteorology. To wrap up, the way we measure this is we use a device called a sling psychrometer. A sling psychrometer is a device that has two thermometers side by side, one with a wick that's wet so the water can evaporate, and then we sling it or aspirate it, and, the, and if the humidity is not 100%, one of these thermometers is going to read lower than the other. We call that the wet bulb depression. We look on a table in a book, or we today we can use a... Um, uh, go on your phone and Google for a set of tables to get the dew point and the relative humidity. So there's a lot more to weather, but that's where we wanted to start today to get you thinking and interested. The internet is full of resources. George, thank you so much, Mr. Bartuska, our weather guy, for being with us to share with us not only about when we talk about aviation, the importance of understanding meteorology and weather. And of course, that's just one more thing those of you that are interested in aviation could certainly study. Our next guest, and I, we are so thankful at the Florida Aviation Network, we are so thankful to Janet Ivy of Janet's Planet for bringing this guest to us. Because many of you, especially those of you that have been longtime listeners and viewers of the Florida Aviation, are going to know this next aviation legend. And there is no other way that we can, that we can describe this particular woman except as an aviation, uh, aviation legend. Her career has spanned through NASA, FFA, FAA, as well as the NTSB. She has over 19,800 flight hours, and she is known not only in our country, but throughout the world. She is known as an aviation expert and an aviation safety expert. So on behalf of Janet's Planet and the Florida Aviation Network, Janet, thank you so much. It is my honor, truly, to introduce aviation legend, Wally Funk. Our next guest is the indefatigable Wally Funk, who has led quite the adventure-studded life. She's traveled the world, shattered glass ceilings, and always, always kept her eyes on the stars. She has relentlessly and joyfully pursued her dreams in aviation and in space, and we couldn't be happier that she is here with us this morning. Wally, thank you for being here. I am so absolutely astounded to be here with you. I want to say that I was born and raised in Taos, New Mexico, which is at 7,000 feet. And uh, my first encountering with an airplane was my parents took me to an airport somewhere in New Mexico. And I saw a DC-3 sitting over there and I went right over there and I tried to turn the nut on that wheel to see if I could make it move. So that was my first experience with aviation. Mother said, oh, she's going to fly. Wally, tell everybody a little bit about your education. I went to Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri. Dr. Bates, who was my advisor, called mother and said, your daughter's not doing too well. And mother said, do you have an airport out there? And he said, yes, you get her out there. And then that's when I really started flying and I got my private license at, I don't know, by 15 or 16. And became a 99. Wally, what do you want us to know about you? I want you to know that I'm impulsive, I'm spontaneous, I'm practical, I'm bold. I, uh, I'm very responsible, never had any access of any type, and I never stop. Now, Wally, you have a very interesting distinction of being a flat first lady astronaut trainee. We want to know what those rigorous tests were like. Now, Astronaut training, 
Uh, Jerry Cobb called me up when I was at Fort Sill and said, Wally, would you like to be an astronaut? And I said, yes. He said, well, you got to call Dr. Loveless in Albuquerque. I did. Dr. Loveless said, well, I want you to be here uh, in a couple of weeks on a Monday morning at eight o'clock. So phase one was of the mercury tests were um, very interesting, a week of tests. The first thing they did is to put a harness around me and put me in a chair and inject 10 degree water in my ear for about six, seven, eight seconds. So I said, oh, interesting. <laughs> and so then obviously I passed. So they took me out, put me in another room for an hour, brought me back, and then they did the other ear. Well, I knew it was going to hurt a little bit, but my right ear is more sensitive because flying, I always had that engine on the right side if it was in a multi engine aircraft. So anyway, I, was so lucky to have passed number one test. Then they would put tubes down me, tubes up me, everything there was to check in a body. So Wally, how many of the women that were tested passed with all flying colors? There were 25 girls selected and only 13 passed. Well, there were 105 guys selected and who did we have? The Mercury 7. So um, uh, I felt very lucky to, to be the person I am that I could pass those tests. When I watched the movie Mercury 13, one of the most interesting tests to me was that sensory deprivation tank. Tell us about that. Now, the test that you're talking about is the isolation test, but there were other tests that they gave me before that. They sent me to Los Alamos and they wanted to know about all the radiation that was in my body which I thought was rather interesting. They poked me, they did everything into my body. They knew everything head to toe. And then they said, now bring your swimming suit. You're gonna be in this pool and uh, we want you to do your best. I said, well, I'll do fine. So I got into the pool and he gave me two pieces of, uh, give me a small book, a Java book. He gave me two pieces of foam rubber. They were about half the size of this book. Foam rubber. I did not have a suit on to keep me afloat. And uh, I had to struggle to lay down and put that foam behind my back and behind my neck and stay steady. Now you guys might wanna try that because it was kind of interesting. So I got myself in position I was steady on the water with the two pieces of foam rubber back and, and back. And then he said, okay, I want you to um, spread eagle. So I was spread eagle, my legs and my arms were out. And then I kind of realized, I kind of touched the water, I couldn't feel it. I licked it, I couldn't touch it. I slapped my face with it, I couldn't feel it. Guess what they had done? They had taken my temperature so many times, they knew what it was, 97 or eight. The water, the humidity, everything in that room was my same temperature and I couldn't feel or test anything. There was no lights. There was a microphone in the, in the center. And uh, he said, I want you to stay there as long as you can. And I said, well, I will do that. So I was in this water couldn't taste anything, couldn't touch anything. So you know what? I was in space because I didn't try to turn, but I could figure my fingers and my, and my toes, I could wiggle them. I couldn't feel anything. So I put my mind that I was up in space and that was what it was gonna be like. And that's what they were gonna be testing me doing. Okay, so I went, a long time, a long time. And finally something came over, uh, a voice came over his head. They said, Wally, how you doing? I said, well, just perfect. Great. He said, well, uh, we're gonna turn the mic back off. And so uh, keep, keep doing as well as you're doing. I said, all right, I will. So more time went on. I had to put my mind as I normally do before I go to bed at night, I put my mind in space way I could go to sleep very quickly 
and I have no problems going to sleep or thinking about things I should have done or shouldn't have done. It is like nice and level and quiet. You might all want to try that. Put your mind somewhere else. So I did that. And pretty soon I heard another voice come on. And he said, uh, Wally, uh, how you doing? I said, I'm doing perfect. He said, well, we are going to turn the lights on now. I want you to take it easy and come to the edge of the pool and put the towel around you and come on out. Now, I didn't tell you this when I went first went in the door to the pool. I saw a clock and it was at 8 something, 8.30. So when I got out, my first thought was, oh, I want to look at that clock as soon as I walk out that door. So I got the towel around me and I got out the door. I turned around. Oh, they were so clever. They covered up the clock. So I had no idea how long I had been in. So they wanted to interrogate me. Did my mind change? Did things change at all while I was in the water? No, I was the same person. I thought the same. And finally, they told me, well, you had stayed in 10 hours and 35 minutes. I was amazed. I, I didn't, 10 hours didn't feel like that at all. But I was so settled in my own mind and body, I could do this very easily. So what was the greatest takeaway or best lesson you learned from all the testing for Mercury 13? Now, I've taken as many astronaut tests as the guys or more. So it was my youth that did it. So you kids that are young, you can do it if you have the want and the will to want to do it. Tell us a little bit about the most powerful influence in your life, which was your mother, Virginia Shy Funk. Mother was so cute. She, she wanted to do these things herself, but her father wouldn't let her. So she let me do anything I wanted to do. Mother always said, don't go faster than your angel can fly. So take that down. Don't go faster than your angel can fly. <laughs> My mom used to tell me the same thing. Wally, what would you tell someone who wants to get into aviation? What is that best path? What do they need to do? Uh, I know right now it's, it's hard for us to get around, but when, when we can, get out there and take a flight. They're a little expensive. Ask your parents if, if you can do it. And um, I, I highly suggest it because it's a part of your life that you would never know. I never knew. It could be so perfect. Now, Wally, you have set records and been the first in many things. Tell us about Mr. Glenn of the FAA and the job he offered you. He gave me a two-hour interview. And at the end of the interview, he said, Wally, we want you to be our first girl FAA inspector. You have everything that we need as an inspector because most of all of our men our retired military. We need somebody that is in the loop now. And that's how I got on with FAA and was with them for four years. And then NTSB liked my get up and go. And I went out and I did accident investigations. I think I did 450 of those around the United States and, and Hawaii. You are indeed amazing, Wally. Any last words for us? Be sure you know what you want to do in life and do it perfectly. And there you have it, the wisdom of Wally Funk. Thank you, Wally, so much for being with us today. And if you're now even more curious about this dauntless, intrepid human being, please read Higher, Faster, Longer. It is Wally's story written by Loretta Hall, and I can't recommend it enough. It's available online at most major booksellers. So check it out. Let your mind revolve around this thought. You're never too young or too old to reach for the stars. And that's the view from Janet's planet. Janet, thank you so much. There is no doubt that you saved the best for last. 
for us at the Florida Aviation Network, she is not only an aviation legend, she is an aviation celebrity. She is number one in our hearts, in our minds. And Janet, we cannot thank you enough for inviting her into our studios today to speak to us and to help inspire the next generation of aviators that are going to take us not only to the skies, but beyond. And you know, I understand that she actually, for those that are interested, has a new book. Here it is, Higher, Faster, Longer. It is her story as told by Loretta Hall. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all the great places that sell books. But again, when I think about Wally, coming up uh, in um, 2021, we will celebrate the 60th anniversary of those first tests that Dr. Loveless uh, performed on those Mercury 13. So 60 years. So any aviator, any female going forward, uh, and especially stepping on the moon and onto Mars, it is standing on the shoulders of her dreams of going to space and all that she has done for aviation. She is a trailblazer, and uh, I still get surprised every time I see the phone ring. There's her name, Janet. What's going on? And she's just full of vim and vigor and everything that you would expect out of her. She is dauntless, fearless, and truly intrepid. And I'm delighted to know her as a human being. But if you've enjoyed this program, I want to make sure to say a big shout out to my dear friend, Dr. Lori Bradner, for co-hosting this with me today. The Florida Aviation Network, thank you more than I can say, uh, to Hoot Gibson, to Don Thomas to Blair Hess, Chuck Tackett, Christopher Lyons, George Bartuska, and Olivia Commander. Jenkins. Yes. Yes. These fantastic people have made our day, and we're so very grateful. If you're interested in learning more about how NASA and aviation is really connected under the NASA Next Gen STEM, if you just Google that, there is a whole, whole section of curriculum under Small Steps to Giant Leaps. That's going to include the X-57 all-electric plane. It's going to talk about the X-59. It's going to give you that sound activity. It's going to have your students create their own X-59 glider and test that out. So if you have any, any questions, please Google NASA Next Gen STEM. Utilize it if you're a homeschooler, in classroom, and if you're ever interested in teacher professional development, Dr. Lori and I love to do that sort of thing as well. All you have to do is just email us at jametsplanet.com. But again, we're here to serve. We're here to inspire. We want to make sure that anybody who wants a future in aviation and space have every opportunity to, to connect with that and learn more. So yeah, look us up and reach out. We are here to serve. Janet, we cannot thank you enough. On behalf of the Florida Aviation Network, this was the first time we have ever done anything like this. And certainly the outreach, not only to those members that are part of the FAA, but to students and teachers, just not only across, across the United States, but I know that you have students from Janet's Planet Astronaut Academy that are tuning in worldwide. And so it has been such a joy and honor and a pleasure. I would also say that any teachers that are listening, this is such a wonderful program, not only for professional development, but please reach out to Janet at janetsplanet.com. Please reach out to her for not only this wonderful curriculum as we help NASA build the next generation of STEM explorers, really that science, technology, engineering, and math. Janet, it has been such a joy. You have just, we have had a jam-packed <laughs> lineup with extraordinary folks. I do not want our time to end, but I know that we are quickly, quickly coming to a close. Again, we want to say thank you that those of you that are interested in follow the Florida A following the Florida Aviation Network, that you can find us on FloridaAviationNetwork.com. Don't forget about Janet'sPlanet.com. And we are just, it has been such our pleasure, such an honor. My name is Lori Bradner. I am your host of the Florida Aviation Network. And that is Janet Ivey, the CEO and founder of Janet's Planet, JP Astronaut Academy, <laughs> and STEM educator, co-conspirator, friend, and sister, 
extraordinaire. And it has been such an honor. And Janet, I was just thinking about something. You know what? I wanted to give one last shout out to all of those students that are listening from K to 12, even those that are in post-secondary. And to tell them that on behalf of Janet's Planet mm -hmm. and on behalf of myself and all of the Florida Aviation Network, we want you to know that you are NASA's next generation. We look to you and we want you to make your dreams and your goals our reality because you are our future. So Janet, I'm gonna let you give one shout out and then it looks like we might have a wrap. I know. I also wanna mention Civil Air Patrol and the EAA. Grant, in the year that 2020, uh, they certainly haven't been flying as many students as normal, but I know that they would love for you to inquire about their programs as well. Civil Air Patrol, uh, EAA with their Young Eagles program. And again, I uh, want to mention the FAA.gov to find out more, more, about more opportunities that are there. But let me end with this thought. Let your mind revolve around this. The universe is always expanding. Let your mind do the same. And that's the view from Janet's Planet. Janet, thank you so much. And my name is Lori Bradner with the Florida Aviation Network. Janet, it has been an honor and a pleasure. And let's do this again. I so think we shall. I <laughs> think we shall. And with Thanks that, watching, everybody. thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>